Laboratory 4, Reaction Kinetics. In this lab, we're going to be exploring uh, continuously stirred tank reactors, batch reactors, by looking at them through three different small miniature experiments. The objective of the first experiment is to determine the second order rate constant in a batch reactor of between two different components. We have crystal violet, which is a very purple, very dark colored solution. It's a very dilute solution, and then we have a more concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide. Now, when combined, the crystal violet and the sodium hydroxide will react to form a colorless product. This is a second order reaction, and you'll be determining the rate constant using the method of excess, or a pseudo first order reaction. And we'll be doing that within a batch reactor. One of the objectives that we want you to do before you come into the laboratory is to know the MSDS for crystal violet and NaOH, which will be posted in the Blackboard folder. Please know the safety considerations of handling these materials, including the disposal, any reaction that will happen with your skin, because these are potentially dangerous chemicals. In the first objective, in the first miniature experiment, we'll be conducting a batch reaction where we'll be putting both of these reactants in known concentrations into a reactor applying continuous stirring and monitoring the state of the reaction. To determine the amount of crystal violet within the solution at any given time, we'll be assessing the solution spectrophotometrically. We'll be taking a sample of the crystal violet or the reaction at any time, putting it into a curvette and assessing the solution in the curvette within a spectrometer at 590 nanometers. The light, absorbance of light, uh, the light absorbance of 590 nanometers takes away the, uh, assesses the amount of yellow being absorbed, which the complementary color violet is what we'll end up seeing, which is what we see in the crystal violet. Therefore, we can determine, quanti we can quantify the amount of purple within the solution at any given time, which we can then relate to the amount of crystal violet remaining in the solution. The product between crystal violet and NaOH, as mentioned, is completely colorless. So as the solution continues to react in the second order, we will eventually get a completely colorless solution, which you'll be able to assess as the end of the experiment. You'll be doing this for three different concentrations of crystal violet and NaOH to get a true estimate of the reaction rate constant for this given reaction. In the second ex mini experiment for this lab, we'll be looking at completely stirred, we'll be looking at continuously stirred tank reactors. Now, as you know, continuously stirred tank reactor must have a reliable input for both crystal violet and the sodium hydroxide. We'll be using a set of peristolic pumps, or positive displacement pumps, to move both solutions into the reactor vessel. Uh, these pumps are not calibrated. When you come in, there is simply a non-engineering graded scale from 0 to 100. It'll be your job to calibrate these pumps to determine a high, a medium, a low. How you do that is up to you. One of the most common methods is simply turn the pump on at a given setting and then record how much water comes through for a given amount of time. For instance, you might have 5 liters per minute, you might have 4 liters per minute under a given setting. You must do a calibration curve so you can determine how, what setting you have to turn on the pumps so that you can have a given residence time within the reactor for a given experiment. And the first time, we want you to have an approximate 8 minute residence time within the first continuously stirred tank reactor. The operation is fairly simple. Once you have the calibration for the pumps, you'll begin pumping in both the crystal violet and the NaOH at given rates. Once the levels reach the impeller, you'll begin the agitation, which you will record, and then you'll assess the amount of crystal violet and the reaction taking place via the spectrophotometric method we just discussed. This is for a single CSTR. you also be doing a, a, a second CSTR in series to the first.
at which point you'll be taking samples from both the first and the second CSTRs to determine the amount of con or the concentration of crystal violet throughout the experiment at any given time. By taking large amounts of data as th in this method, you'll be able to smooth out your curves, find the idealized to the experimental reaction rates. In the final experiment, the determinant of residence time distribution, or the RTD, is going to be a slightly more simple experiment. In this experiment, you'll be filling the one of the CSTRs up with the crystal violet solution, and you'll be pumping in water. The water will then disperse the CTSR, will not react as had been done in previous experiments, but will give you the amount of time it takes to fully clear under agitation the CV from the CTSTR. You'll then be able to gain the residence time distribution and back calculate any the effect of the RTD on the previous calculations you determined in the second experiment. All of these together, you'll be able to use the equations that were given to you in the lab manual to determine the full characteristics of the CTSTRs and the reaction that we'll be modeling within this experiment. We'll now head down to the laboratory where we'll introduce some of the equipment and talk about the safe handling of some of the chemicals. Okay, here we are in the reaction kinetics lab. We are in F103. Um, for this laboratory, the safety considerations will be the same as the vapor liquid equilibrium. You will be required to wear safety coat, safety glasses, and gloves for the duration of the lab, as we'll be working with chemicals which can be damaging to your skin and eyes. Please review the MSDS before you come into this laboratory. Although in this lab, like all of the others, you'll be reporting in pairs, it is absolutely imperative that the job of every person in the lab be carefully orchestrated. One person must be taking samples, one person will be combining, one person will be timing, and one person will be assessing. Without coordinated effort, your timing will be inconsistent. You must make sure that consistently you take a sample, you take the measurement, you take a sample, you take a measurement. Otherwise, your curves will be deviating from the expected smooth curves for a second order rate reaction. This can be planned beforehand, adjusted throughout the lab to make sure that everyone can experience every different position. However, make sure that you are well coordinated and working together in the small vicinity that we have available so you're not bumping into the yourselves or the other group performing the vapor liquid equilibrium. Now, here's our apparatus. We have stir plate for our batch reactor. We have two CSTRs with variable agitation. We have our peristolic pumps, and we have our spectrometer. Now first, I'll go over, as we went over in the theory, each one of the laboratory objectives. During the first experiment, your batch reactor will be combining the pre-prepared solution of crystal violet and sodium hydroxides in different concentrations into our batch reactor, which will simulate using a beaker. This will be continuously stirred on the stir plate and will be taking samples every 30 seconds as, so as to properly characterize the reaction between the sodium hydroxide and the crystal violet to form the colorless reactant. We'll be measuring the amount of colorless reactant by pulling a sample every 30 seconds from our batch reactor into our curvette. Now, this curvette has up on it a little triangle in the front. It is imperative that you put the triangle in the front into the front of the spectrometer as you're directing the light through the front out the back. The sides of these curvettes are frosted and often very scratched. That will interfere with the absorbance of light and your taken reading. Additionally, any bubbles within the solution, you must tap the glass to remove the bubbles. And any scratches, if there are any scratches or cracks on the curvettes, throw it in the garbage and choose another one, as these will very strongly interfere with the light as it passes through the curvette. Now, once you have the sample filled to the line and to the little top of the line, we'll be placing it into the spectrometer. As such, just down into the machine, it locks in with a little spring. You'll be closing the cap, and then you'll be able to take your absorbance reading. 
Before you take any readings, you must supply a blank. When blanking the instrument, make sure first that you've placed your water without bubbles into the instrument, closed. Secondly, make sure we're reading at 590 nanometers. This spectrometer is capable of assessing the absorbance at the full length of visible light. We're going to make sure that we go to 590 nanometers. Once our water is in, we will hit the zero ABS, which will blank the sample. And we should have a 0, 0.000 absorbance units, which will be higher every time we put in a sample, which will then change as the reaction takes place. Additional of note is that when you take the sample, as soon as you put it in, this is when you take the measurement. As soon as the number pops up, you take the measurement. As the reaction is oncurring, within the curvettes. So you must take the sample number, or the absorbance, and the time at which you actually take the measurement. Don't trust it for when you drew it from the batch reactor, as the experiment will continue, or the reaction will continue to occur within the curvette. So, as quickly as you can, and as consistently as you can, take the sample, load the curvette, place into the instrument, read the absorbance units, and then record that and the time it at the measurement time. In the second objective, we'll be using the CSTRs. In order to place material, crystal violet, and the sodium hydroxide into the CSTR vessel, we'll be using peristolic positive displacement pumps. These pumps can move in counterclockwise or clockwise directions, so make sure first that you're moving in the proper direction, and then you'll be calibrating the instrument. Now, we have one hose, for the crystal violet, and one hose for the sodium hydroxide. Please maintain using a crystal violet hose for the crystal violet and a sodium hydroxide hose for the sodium hydroxide, as the crystal violet is an extremely tenacious dye and is very difficult to remove once it has been hardened, as is evidenced by a lot of the equipment. These quick connections will allow us to connect the peristolic tubes to the CST CSTR by simply pushing on the little metal piece, which will move the pin out of the way, we can insert the quick connect, release, and we should be locked into place. Ensure that both the crystal violet and the sodium hydroxide are connected before activating any of the peristolic pumps. Now, to activate the unit, you simply turn on the power located at the back, and then you'll be setting from 0 to 100 the non-engineering scale of how fast the pump will be moving in either the clockwise or the counterclockwise direction. You'll have to be use, you will use a graduated cylinder and a supply of water to get the volumetric assessment of how much zero, well, zero will be zero liters per minute, however, how much 50 compared to 100 will be, and then you do a calibration curve so that you can maintain a specific residence time in each one of these vessels. Attaining the volume for the vessel, again, should be similar. You'll be able to fill with water, remove, and assess how much water is in at a given time, and then adjust your flow rates to accommodate for a given residence time. Once there is sufficient liquid within the C CSTR that you're covering the impeller located in the middle, which is a little bit difficult to see on camera, but you can look in the top and see the impeller, you'll be able to turn on the unit by adjusting the speed here, until appropriate to maintain a continuously stirred environment. Too high, you'll create significant vortexing, possible splashing. Too low, and you'll be not maintaining that continuously stirred environment, and you'll be reaching and you'll be deviating from the ideal situation. Under normal operating conditions, the bottom of the CSTR will drain from either here or here, and these must be closed depending on the dynamics of each experiment. When working with the RTD, when you'll be filling this completely with crystal violet and adding water, ensure that you have had connected the water properly and that you use the appropriate flow rate that matches the previous experiments in both crystal violet and sodium hydroxide addition so that you can properly compare the RTD to the CSTR function. When you're collecting data from the CTSRs, you'll be sampling out from the top and when you're running two in series, it is absolutely imperative that you sample one every 30 seconds and then the other one. 
and then the first one, and the other one, to get a good glimpse of what's actually happening within the system. When sampling one, it is acceptable to do one every 60 seconds, as this experiment is slightly slower than the previous batch experiment. That brings us to cleanup. The cleanup for this lab is a bit more extensive, as you must run water through all of the lines, through both CSTRs, and make sure that everything is tidied up at the end of the lab. This will form a portion of your grade. During the cleanup and throughout the experiment, we must ensure that none of the sodium hydroxide or crystal violet goes down the drain. We have a special waste deposit bucket for all of the reaction product from this laboratory, which we dispose of at the end of every laboratory.